evening when I got a call from Karen Johnson from the library. And she was asked me if I wouldn't mind if they put uh, my book on the shelves with me. Mind. <laughs> I was thrilled. I was very excited. And then she said, uh, would I consider being part of their Fresh Voices program and come to the, the Stone Harbor Library on, on March 16th and give, you know, an informal talk to a few people just about how the book arrived when I came up the background of it. Again, I was so excited. I happened to have been on my way to Acme for food shopping when the call came. So I hung up and I went to Acme. And everyone I knew in that store, customers, employees, I went up and buttonholed them and every one of them knew that I was going to have a book in the library. <laughs> Part of the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> I'm still excited and have been all along. But um, it's a long time stretch from <laughs> January to, to March. And I began to have um, anxiety dreams. You know, the ones where you, uh, you sit down to take an exam and not only have you not studied, but you don't even know what the subject is, or the, <clears throat> the uh, dream where you're in this social setting, this lovely setting, and you look down and you're naked. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the dreams every once in a while, I began to worry whether nobody would come, and I'd be so embarrassed, sort of you know, talking to you. To, uh, you know. Well, I guess all is well because it's March 16th, and I'm here, and I'm fully clothed, and you have all come. So thank you so much for coming and making it okay. <coughs> Before I start, I have to, yeah, that's better. You want to, you need to disturb me. Worry about it. Um, before I start, I have a disclaimer. You know, at the beginning of books or at the end of a movie frequently, there'll be this one sentence that says something about the views of the author, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I don't know. But um, I have to tell you a story first. Years ago, when my youngest uh, son, Danny, was um, in high school, he got a job in the local Burger King. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he was too young to drive, so I would be the one that would take him to his job. Uh, no problem. The place was close by, and he would have been at school all day, and this was a chance for us to yak and, and talk and catch up on things. So, <clears throat> this one day, we were stopped at a red light, <clears throat> and talking, talking, talking. I, I have to say, two rescuers are great talkers. So. This was fun. I happened to look up, the light turned green, just for a second. <gasps> Where are we going? Of course, I made the right turn. I remembered right away. But he looked, Danny looked at me, and he said, Ma, it is going to be so great when you become senile. Nobody's going to know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so here is my disclaimer, okay? If, um, if I have some word finding difficulties this evening, or my sentences begin to trail off into sort of nowhere or I jump around, it has nothing to do with the fact of my advanced age or of an onset of dementia. I've just always been like this. <laughs> so it's funny, really, given that. Uh, quality or characteristic that I should write a memoir. I mean, memoir is based on memory, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's also funny because um, I, I have never written anything all my life long. Um, oh, I wrote, you know, what I did on my summer vacation back in elementary school. I did book reports, term papers. Uh, in college, of course, wrote more and wrote for my, my degrees. I never wrote papers. But, and, and I will say, I have written poetry most of my life, like, like many people do. Uh, but that was very spontaneous and private. Uh, so I have written nothing, literally nothing. Read voraciously, but never turned it around and did any writing. And then I was 86, and I heard about a program in the library on how to write a memoir. And uh, I thought at that point, I remembered that my children kept giving me books for Christmas or occasions, you know, where you fill it out like a how-to book to write your, your story and so forth, so you could pass it on to your children and grandchildren, et cetera. And I happen to believe that's a great idea. Um, I mean, I, I still, every once in a while, think, oh, why didn't I ask my mother that? Or why didn't I find out about that particular thing? So I believed in it. But these books were, I don't know, I couldn't seem to get into them. I was excited, you know, by getting them and trying to do it. 
but they were almost like filling out a form. Now you write this, now this, now this. And I don't do well with forms, and I don't like to be told what to do. So I, it didn't work too well. And I would put them back on the shelf, and uh, sometime later, pristine, they would find their way into some sort of book drive or something like that. Um, but at this point, I heard about the workshop. I thought, well, maybe it's time. Maybe I should, I should try to do this. And I did. I went to the first <laughs> session. It was a nice group, big round table, maybe 10, 12 people. Um, <clears throat> after we all introduced ourselves and uh, gave a little bit of a, a background, um, Eva Feely, who was the uh, director at that time of the, of the workshop, she looked up and she said, memoirs are not autobiography. Interesting. She said, autobiography is pretty much the, the whole story of a life. Uh, touching on just about everything, uh, maybe not in depth, but intended to be factual. She said, memoirs are snapshots. This snapshot, that snapshot, this moment, that moment. Uh, not necessarily all connected. Uh, maybe many years apart, or even, even moments that were separated, different people and so forth. But they would be significant moments that the memoirist wanted to write about. And uh, she said the one thing that, that, that held them all together was a theme, a scope that would bring them all together. Uh, uh, an idea for a theme is there was a woman there who had already written her memoirs and published them. Um, uh, was and, but that was about her father. She wrote about her father. Uh, she was there because she was starting a new book on her mother, so she was back. There was a man who thought, well, uh, he, he had traveled extensively in the Far East because of his job, and maybe he would write about that. There was another man who thought, well, maybe it's about time. I sat down and wrote about my adventures in the service in the war. They sort of had their themes pretty specific. I didn't at that but I began to have kind of an inkling on what it might be. When I was uh, early 20s, somebody gave me a book called The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. Anybody know The Prophet? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. As you know, then, it's a series of uh, short essays set up in a question and answer kind of setting uh, where the prophet spoke about all the important things in life. Now, when he, someone asked him, Tell us about love. And he uh, said it in a sort of an ancient rural setting. He, he compared it, talked about a floor, a big empty floor, where they would bring in the wheat, the harvested wheat, and lay it out on the floor. And then men would take flails, big long sticks with a loose end on like that, and just beat the wheat and beat it and beat it. And they did that to loosen the, um, the, the kind of loose, already stock of the wheat called chaff that was of no value in particular. And the wind would then drive it away. What was left was the, of course, the good, right um, wheat. He said, this is what he said about love. If you would have only love's pleasure and none of love's pain, pass out from the threshing floor into a seasonless world where you'll laugh, not all of your laughter, and you will weep, but not all of your tears. Then and now, I change the word love to life. And then and now, I still think it is the most tragic thing to live a life, not for her, to turn aside and let things drop that might have been. I decided then and now that I did not want to live that way. I wanted to live in a season of world. I wanted to laugh all my laughter. I wanted to cry all my tears. Uh, not always the easiest way to live, uh, because you have to, you really have to face tough But that's what I decided. So I thought maybe, uh, maybe I can make that a theme somehow. Um, I know I can. I can write about the significant moments, the snapshots in which I was totally alive. Uh, maybe moments of self-discovery, or um, where my life was suddenly changed, and moment of great awareness. So, okay, all right, I'm almost hooked. 
Okay? So I come home, I'm thinking about this theme, I walk in the door, and what confronts me but album after album, <laughs> like these. I think I counted at one point that there may be like 10 more of them. Okay, now most of them are about my trips. And I do, I do I collect not only a, you know, photographs, snapshots, but memorabilia and so forth. But there I looked, I thought, memory? It's all there for me. It's my tools. I also have journals. Uh, this one is sort of rather falling apart, <laughs> if you can see. This one is from 1953, believe it or not. But I do have journals. Now, they're mainly for the trips. I don't journal every day or keep a diary, but I thought, wow, my tools are all here. If my memory fails me, I've got I can. So, um, I, and it, so I sat down, I opened volume one, and I began to look. Oh, I'm sorry, now you know the sun. Uh, and I learned something very quickly, was that there's a difference between remembering and reliving. Remembering is, oh, you know, you know, there's the book. Oh, I remember that now. Suddenly a, minute, a, a, a snapshot grabs you, and suddenly you're back there, wherever it is. You can even hear the music that's, um, that we're playing, maybe, or smell the smells, or whatever. That, to me, is reliving. Um, and that's what began to happen as I was going through this. I thought, OK, I've not only got my tools, but I already know I've started with my, my particular snapshots. The suggestion had been made that we write maybe the first week about beginnings, maybe our name or uh, um, a place where we lived or something like that. <clears throat> and so, I am in the kitchen. The door is still swinging a little behind me, making that funny squeak. Mommy turns and looks at me. She has that big tan bowl with the green stripe in it and the bend of her arm. And she's using a silver spoon with a curled edge to beat something in it. Maybe making an egg or maybe cookies? Mommy, mommy, come lick the bowl, please, please. She frowns, trying to look fierce. But I laugh, because I know that after she pours the batter into that shiny pan and bends down to give me the bowl, there will be a small pool of batter left. But let me get Tiny chocolate butter, just for me. A childhood ritual, a memory among so many memories that ties me to this long ago time, this place, this house where I spent the first 25 years of my life. It was built in 1923, five years before I was born in 1928. I believe it was a Sears Roebuck house, craftsman bungalow, nine rooms, one bathroom, that was packaged and sent from Washington State, complete with plans, blueprints, wood all cut to specification, screws, nails, windows, hinges, whatever was needed by the builder who would construct it on Lot 420, Brook Avenue in Passaic, New Jersey. From my photo album, I take a picture of the newly built home, maybe 1924 or 25, and on a whim, I Google the address. And up comes a full color print of the 20, 2014 house, 90 years later, that looks almost exactly the same. Okay, I'm going to start stop for a second because I just have, um, I guess I just have three of copies of the book. I, I thought I might like to pass it out, and you can be looking at it while I'm talking because there are pictures in the back. Of that one too. Uh, pictures in the back of, of what I'm going to be saying. So. Uh, why don't you do that? Also, although I'm starting to talk about the very beginnings, uh, you can see what the end result was like, what the uh, structure was like. So maybe you could you can then just, just look at the pictures in the back. Okay, so there's the picture of the house in the back, if you have it, you can see it. It, it's amazing that it was there. And what happened was it had recently been for sale, so it was still on one of the real estate pages, web page, and that's why I was able to pull it up. But it's incredible. It nearly takes my breath away. I bring up the inside scenes on my computer, and I'm amazed at how small everything is. I wander from room to room and find that the only one that is really different is that one of those pictures. The playroom, my father's studio, the dining room where I could play under the table, Absolutely certain no one could see me. 
all right at memory's fingertips. I got my bedroom where I slept in a crib until I was four years old, uh, when I got my new jelly bed, so named by my father for the bouncy night. Oh dear, the thoughts, the memories are coming now, thick and fast, tumbling over one another until they're almost busy. I must choose. I'm tired, but I don't want to go to sleep yet, Bobby. In the corner, just under the place where the ceiling slants down, I'm bouncing on my jelly bed. Mommy says, settle down, and folds me into the warm covers. She recites softly, my bed is a little boat. Mommy tucks me in when I'm alone. She puts me in my sailor suit as if we're sailing in the dark. Or maybe tonight it will be wink and blink and a nod one night so off in a wooden ship. My eyes are getting so heavy, Mommy says. Forget. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep us. Mommy and Daddy show us make our own good girl. In those early years, um, every I was so happy and so thankful for the house that I grew up in. I thought it was the world, actually, it was two, three, but uh, around about six, seven, or eight, I, I was already beginning to travel far outside the edges of Fort Twinning Brook. There was school playing in that wonderful woods behind the house, camping with my sister pushing potatoes deep into the embers of the little fires we built, then breaking through the black, flaky crust to burn my tongue on the rich, white, crumbling insides. We would visit friends and family, some so far away we had to travel by car. But no matter how far we went, or come to think of it, how far I have traveled in all my 87 years, that house, that home is still my starting place. My long ago beginning of everything that was to come and I treasure it still, as I treasure the family that lived there, <coughs> that gave me so much that helped to make me who I am today. <coughs> uh, in those early years also, the, I think the, uh, the member of the family, well, it was mother, father, my older sister, Phyllis, and myself, is I was, I was so close to my father. We were pals, and he was pretty much my teacher for those first few years. Now that I am 10, every evening I ride my bike to the train station to meet Daddy. There's an awful fusty kind of smell in the underground passageway that leads to the other side where the train will pull in, so I went over there. Here it comes, the noisy, puffing train from New York, <coughs> where my Daddy works, and here he comes, bounding up the stairs. He hugs me, calls me my pal, and off we go home, me pushing my bike and talking lickety-split nonstop. He just listened smiling as though I was the most important person in his day. After dinner, we would sometimes take a walk. Oh, Daddy, how real these memories were. Although I don't know it, I didn't know it at the time, those walks, those wonderful talks, and we talked about just about everything, uh, gave me a spiritual base, a unique and special yearning for meaning for my life, far beyond everyday expectation. You built the world for me, the world for me and gave me God in sweet, gentle, everyday language that was never pretentious or preachy. I remember one special night. We were walking somewhere in rural North Jersey, maybe Wolfpack. Um, it was a summer evening, cooling slowly in the soft, darkening sky. A country road, a beautiful leafy tree spreading its branches halfway across the sunset. The moon just beginning to fashion itself in the lower branches. You stopped me, put your arm around my shoulders, and said, this is my church. This is my worshipful place where I truly see the beauty and the magic of this world. No heaven could truly match. A lovely, lovely man. Uh, as I approached teenage years, um, you know, he began to sort of fade in the background. I had all new friends and all the things that, that teenage friends. Um, and, but, uh, he has, well, all my life I called him daddy, even when he was only 55, to give you an idea of the closeness there was between us. But in any case, I was beginning to move away, as you should and you do in your teen years. But then something happened, and then here's, here's a, a, a snapshot that is a very sort of private one, but a very important one as far as I was concerned. One some, warm summer evening in 1943, shortly after I turned 15, I remember feeling a prickly kind of excitement, edgy, a bit restless, as though something were about to happen. I decided to take a walk. This 
those particular June evenings, excuse me, uh, felt different somehow. A cool breeze sprang up, a comfort on warm summer nights like this. And as images softened in the fading light, I had a very important thought, an epiphany, if you will. Perhaps for the first time in my life, I knew without a doubt exactly where and when I was. I was a young adult. I felt the beginnings and anticipations of adulthood. I was eager for all that would come to me. But at the same time, I was a child still, and all of childhood belonged to me. It was absolutely real and alive, and it was every day. I could savor all the excitement, the taste, the smells, the joys, and the discoveries of each day being a child born. I felt sad just then, because I also knew with certainty I was losing all that forever. That tomorrow I would remember all those things perfectly, but they would never really be alive in me again. A moment of truth, of transition, of leave taking, and of welcoming the new. This was a pause when I could actually experience and watch myself step into a future. I held that fragile moment in my hands a while, afraid that it would break too soon turned and walked slowly home. When I woke the next morning, it was a different world. This world is a bit scarier. So much is new, not done before. Wider, graduating high school, it stretched all the way to Dover, Delaware, to Wesley Junior College, and first time living away from home. It was noisier, with new friends and heart-bruising crushes. There was a job, and yes, a new flowering, and a first love, and more adventures to come. From then on, my life tended to take the usual course of, you know, a, a, a young woman in my time, in my society. I was going to be following all the regular milestones, okay? Um, marriage, job, or oh, I had a job, marriage, children, uh, houses, all of that. And I was pleased to be looking forward. However, I do have to, I do have to take that back a little bit. I did have one thing that happened first before all of that, all the milestones came. Uh, and that was when I was 24, I had, I had a wonderful best friend, our only friend, we've been friends since fourth grade. And the two of us uh, were now working, and our first year um, of when we had vacation, we went to Bermuda for eight days. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful. We were taken with islands, and we thought that's not it for the next one. Next year, we went to Nantucket. Not quite as exotic as, as Bermuda, but we loved it. We even flew back on, on, on Labor Day for a, a few days. And we were talking to my mother shortly thereafter that, telling her all the things that happened on our news vacations. And she kind of smiled and she said, well, what island are you going to go to next year? <coughs> and both of us, without thinking almost, we had to just discuss it. We had thought about it, but we hadn't made any plans. We both automatically said, the British Isles. Now, <laughs> we, that, that was it. Our plans were already made. We scrimped and saved for the next few few months. I smoked every cigarette three times. <laughs> and then you bought it very carefully and you put it back in the pack and then when you take it out again, a few more months. <laughs> Can you imagine what that did to my lungs? <laughs> I, I always ordered the absolute cheapest sandwich <laughs> on the menu for lunch. We saved our money and in August, Nine weeks, nine countries we tour Europe. Now today, that's really not such a you know a terribly different thing. Uh, you know, we do go off and travel a lot, but then I mean, we're talking. Uh, this was only seven or eight years after the end of World War II. Europe was still um, you know very unsettled. It was just not something people did easily, but we did, <laughs> and it was it was truly wonderful. Um, Came back from that. Oh, by the way, the trip is in the is in the that, that 1953. And this is the, as I said, this is the journal. So if you want to know how old I am, you can just take a look at this. But <laughs> we came back. I uh, met my husband, husband to be. We got married. Three wonderful children, and they were perfect and exceptional, and still are. Um, we, you know, I I went back to school. Actually, completed my education, got my degree, and then my master's degree. Um, I did, all, you know, all of those things. Uh, meanwhile, the children are growing, and uh, oh, is there anybody here who lives in Stone Harbor? Who is from Stone Harbor? 
Oh, well, good. I don't have to apologize then, because I was going to. Because in this ordinary life going on and children growing, every year we vacation down here. We're from New York, there's a vacation. And I was going to give a sincere 